If you think about the image of the U.S., it's very coffee, nervous energy, very work, work, work. It's, it's a very American drink. It began in Seattle, in a little store that sold coffee beans. Starbucks really was on a mission to convert people to a life that included better coffee. It's your decaf short latte. People had really never heard of a latte, never heard of a cappuccino. Oh, cappuccino. So Starbucks brought something brand new. Triple grande mocha. A new language and a worldwide brand invented by this man, Starbucks chairman Howard Schultz. I do think he believes that he's delivering more than coffee to people. We're not in the business of filling bellies. We're in the business of filling souls. Starbucks and its star, Howard Schultz. In the 21st century, it seems that no one can get along without their daily double low-fat latte or one of a dizzying array of caffeinated pick-me-ups of choice. And Jenny, I have a grande peppermint non-fat light with mocha. And no one company sells more coffee drinks to more people in more places than Starbucks. Starbucks has more than 13,000 stores in 39 countries around the world, and it opens a new one every five hours, 24-7. Starbucks attracts 44 million people a week. Thank you, Americans have always liked their coffee. They drink about 330 million cups of the stuff a day, enough to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool 35 times over. Just a couple of decades ago, a cup of coffee cost around 50 cents and often tasted just what it looked like. Have you had one of these yet? Oh, yeah. This is mocha coconut frappuccino. Thank you. This is the man who changed all of that. The man who discovered a way to charge four bucks for a cup of coffee. One might call him the star of Starbucks. The company's chairman, Howard Schultz. He remembers the first time he walked into the original Starbucks in Seattle, Washington. It was 1981. When I walked in this store for the first time, I know this sounds really hokey, and I knew I was home. I can't explain it, but I knew I was in a special place, and the product kind of spoke to me. And to be honest with you, when I first came out here, I had never had a good cup of coffee. I met the founders of the company and really heard for the first time the story of great coffee. Back then, Schultz was a 30-year-old appliance salesman from New York, and Starbucks had been around for 10 years in Seattle. Schultz wasn't in at the birth of Starbucks. He learned to appreciate the better beans in life from the company's original owners, old college buddies Jerry Baldwin and Gordon Bowker, and their neighbor, Zev Siegel, three friends who founded Starbucks in the early 1970s. I'd say we were all about 27 at that time, and the the subject of business kind of interested us. I wouldn't say it consumed us at the time, but we began to talk about ideas. The three men loved fine coffee, but couldn't find any in their adopted city of Seattle. When you went to a supermarket in 1970 and uh, wanted to buy coffee, this stuff was all in cans. This was not very good coffee by today's standards. And there wasn't a single store in Seattle that would be called a gourmet coffee store. So they started up the Starbucks Coffee, Tea, and Spice Company in 1971. They learned the secrets of roasting beans from the man who supplied them to the young entrepreneurs in the early years, Alfred Pete. Pete's Coffee and Tea Leaves was based near Berkeley, California. Starbucks in Seattle reflected the slightly hippie aura of the back-to-real-food movement that began in California. It's actually very tied to the 60s uh, counterculture movement. Um, because at the same time we started getting into decent coffee, we started getting into whole foods and real food, so to speak. And so that's actually where it started, I think, is this idea of food should be real food. It shouldn't be ground up in a can sitting there for 27 years. An early picture shows the three founders in long hair and aprons standing by bins in their new store. This place just reeked of coffee. You knew immediately you were in a coffee store before you saw the beans. Also, a nice feature of this store is that it had along uh, one side a beautiful old brick wall. And so it had a sort of a grounded feeling to it. The owners built the original Starbucks with their own hands. 
Sweat equity was a substitute for their lack of capital. We built the fixtures for um, the first store. We built the shelving system, we built the coffee bins. There was a logo element that uh, wrapped around the room in the first storefront, and um, we built those, and we even built the exterior signs. Popular lore says that the company is named after a Starbuck, the first made in Herman Melville's Moby Dick. But the real story behind the name comes from an old Mount Rainier mining camp. S-T-A-R-B-O, which is a name that Gordon Bowker found on a map. Somebody suggested uh, just off the top of their head that uh, maybe we should also look at Starbuck. And that mutated into Starbucks uh, without the apostrophe. Surely, um, on a subliminal level, we were influenced by uh, the character in Moby Dick, or, you know, there could have been other associations, too. They also came up with the company's ubiquitous mermaid logo. The mermaid is part of the seafaring heritage of coffee coming to America, and, and it comes by boat. It's really a two-tailed siren that's been reshaped over the years. The original mermaid icon survives only at the original Starbucks. Over the years, her bare-breasted contours have been transformed and covered up. Well, over the years, it became uh, politically incorrect, and so we have took the liberty of, of refining her. For merchants, like real estate agents, the most important thing is location, and Starbucks' first location turned out to be a fortuitous one. The Pike Place Market on Seattle's seafront was being revitalized when Starbucks opened. Within sight of the water and watched over by soaring seagulls, the market became a popular place for tourists and locals attracted by its fresh fish and produce. It was the perfect place to open up a gourmet coffee store. How are you doing this afternoon? You'd come in and you would be greeted. That was a very Thanks important a thing to us. It became almost a family kind of relationship. Uh, talking about coffee, about the market. It was really a, a, almost a romantic setting. Still, Starbucks Gourmet Coffee didn't exactly fly off the shelves in those early days. I can remember days where we would close out the cash register and there would be 60 or $70 on it. It's just hard to believe now. Like in any new business, there were challenges. One day, the coffee bean shipment didn't make it over the mountains from California to Seattle. I remember distinctly uh, opening the store one Saturday morning with no coffee in it. We had run out of coffee. The truck had been uh, trapped in a snowstorm somewhere in the, the, the Siskiyou Mountains. Nevertheless, they sold coffee to over 100 customers that day. And you might say, how could they buy coffee if there wasn't any? And the answer is, we took orders and we explained to them that when the coffee arrived, we'd bring it to their house. Home delivery was just one tactic Starbucks owners used to win over customers. Did you try our new cinnamon dolce latte? Um, they knew they had to educate people on the merits of good coffee if they were going to sell any. In its first year, uh, Starbucks really was on a mission to uh, convert people to uh, a life that included better coffee. We were missionaries. Siegel worked full time behind the counter, giving out free samples of fresh brewed coffee and imparting information about the superior roast and beans of Starbucks over the supermarket brands. The coffee was vastly superior. It wasn't uh, something that uh, was a fabrication. When you put them side by side, there was no comparison. By 1981, there were three Starbucks in Seattle. Ironically, at the time, you couldn't buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Starbucks sold only tea leaves and spices, roasted coffee beans, and the equipment to brew European-style gourmet coffee at home. The only drinks on hand were free samples. We were not a coffee bar. You did not go into Starbucks in, say, 1976 and expect to get a cafe latte uh, and that the uh, double cupped and you were going to walk around with it. That just wasn't part of our world. That's another age that was yet to come. The coming of the modern Starbucks would arrive with Howard Schultz. In the early 1980s, he was the director of sales for a company that sold European coffee makers in the U.S. He noticed he was selling more to the small operation in Seattle than to Macy's. And every month, every quarter, these numbers were going up, even though Starbucks just had a few stores. And I said, I got to go out to Seattle. Once in the Northwest, Schultz had an epiphany. I came to Seattle on this beautiful day, this majestic day that only happens, you know, very few times a year. 
The sun was shining, the snow was on the mountains. I walked into the Pike Place Market where we are today. I walked into the store. He was greeted at Starbucks with a free sample that would change his life. And I walked in here and I had a French press of Indonesian coffee, coffee from Sumatra. And I said, you know, what is this? And it felt like, and it smelled like, and it tasted like a big burgundy wine. And I wanted to learn more. And I just couldn't get out of my system. That's good. Very good. And I just said, God, this is, uh, this is something I've been looking for my whole professional life. Howard lobbied Starbucks founders for a place in the company. It would take nearly a year for him to convince them to hire him. Howard was very different than others at Starbucks when he came into the company. It was, I'm sure it was difficult to get his foot in the door because he walked in and looking great in his suit from New York and, you know, the great ties and the Porsche. And that really was just not the style of Starbucks at the time. My impression of Howard at that time was that he was a fabulous communicator. One to one, he still is. He uh, had a lot of drive. That drive eventually convinced Starbucks founders to hire Schultz as head of sales. And Howard set about making his mark on the company while making Starbucks' mission his own. As vice president of sales for Starbucks, Howard Schultz went to the Milan Houseware Show in 1983 to look at coffee makers. It was his first trip to Italy, and on its streets, he fell in love with the theater and romance of the Italian coffee bar. He was struck by an idea that seems obvious in retrospect, but hit him at the time with the force of St. Paul's revelation on the way to Damascus. Starbucks should sell not just coffee beans, but coffee drinks. I saw something, not only the romance of coffee, but really what it was, was the sense of community and the connection that people had to coffee the place and one another. And after a week in Italy, I was so convinced with such unbridled enthusiasm that I couldn't wait to get back to Seattle to talk about the fact that I had seen the future. When Howard came back from Milan, he was on fire. He was out of his mind that it was that we had to open a coffee bar, like a Milan-style coffee bar. Stand up, light food, coffee to go. Howard's enthusiasm for opening coffee bars in Starbucks stores wasn't shared by Starbucks creators. Oh, it was a sore subject. Throughout the 70s, we um, served coffee in our store. We even, at one point, uh, had a nice big espresso machine behind the counter, but we said, oh no, that's, that's not for us. We were in the bean business. I was crushed. Nonetheless, he was persistent, and finally, the owners let him establish a coffee bar in a new store Starbucks was opening in Seattle. It was an instant success, bringing in hundreds of people a day and introducing a whole new language. We introduced the beverage and the word cafe latte to Seattle in 1985, which now is ubiquitous across America and around the world. We did that. But the success of the coffee bar demonstrated to the original founders that they didn't want to go in the direction Schultz wanted to take them. They didn't want to get big. We were not a coffee bar. That just wasn't part of our world. We were a store that sold coffee beans. Their whole thing about the coffee, it was always about maintaining quality. It was not about growth. It was not about a worldwide brand. It was about a small, manageable company where we could keep quality at its highest. Disappointed, Howard left Starbucks in 1985 to open a coffee bar chain of his own called Il Giornale. Changes were underway at Starbucks, too. Two years earlier, Jerry Baldwin had pounced on an opportunity to buy his old mentor's company, Pete's Coffee and Tea. However, the pressures of running both businesses from Seattle proved too great. So in March of 1987, Jerry offered Howard a deal. Howard took me to the boardroom in a corner and whispered, Jerry's going to sell us the company. We were out of our minds. However, Howard had to struggle to raise the $3.8 million price tag for Starbucks and then more money to build more stores. We had 11 stores and 100 employees. And I should mention, I didn't have a dime to my name. I had no way to raise money. The purchase price of Starbucks in August of 87 will sound like a, a ridiculously low number, but to me it was 
a billion dollars. Schultz had to convince investors that Americans would actually shell out high prices for a beverage they were used to getting for 50 cents almost anywhere. Most Americans didn't know a high-grade coffee bean from a teaspoon of instant Nescafe. In fact, coffee consumption in the U.S. had been going down since 1962. If I came to you in 1987 and I said to you, uh, even though coffee consumption in America is down, I want to build a company that was going to sell coffee not in a porcelain cup but in a paper cup with Italian saying words that no one could pronounce for three dollars a cup of coffee would you invest plenty of people said no but enough people said yes they were betting that a rising tide of interest in america in all things gourmet and high styled would draw customers to high-end and high-priced coffee and starbucks offered a higher-end product a higher-end setting a more expensive product that allowed us to say we were part of this kind of more emerging kind of middle to upper middle class. Schultz raised the money and merged his own company with Starbucks. Times were tight and Schultz himself pitched in behind the bar. I was making lattes, cappuccinos, espresso macchiatos, and we were, much of what we did back then was creating awareness by just giving samples to people. They had never heard of these beverages. And then we had to kind of validate for people that there was a price relationship to the fact that this wasn't coffee that was going to cost 50 cents. 20 years ago, people had really never heard of a latte, never heard of a cappuccino, much less had coffee besides what you might get out of a can. So Starbucks brought something brand new. For decades, American coffee had been an overstewed, bitter brew percolated up in kitchens and diners throughout the land. We're one of the few nations that um, do this boiling to death kind of approach and then you keep it hot for hours at a time which is just the death of a good tasting cup of coffee before starbucks the diner and the coffee clatch were the most common american sites for coffee consumption outside the home and the only thing classy about the product was when it was served by someone like first lady jacqueline kennedy at the white house but america's history with coffee would change in seattle there are a couple of reasons I think that Seattle works as the place where coffee is born. One is it's cold and damp, and a hot drink, particularly a hot drink with some milk in it, tastes really good. Secondly, I think Seattle attracted the kind of people who wanted to engage in the kinds of consumption that Starbucks offered. Seattle was going through a transformation in the 1980s. High-tech companies like Microsoft were attracting highly educated and well-paid professionals to town the kinds of people who were interested in making status distinctions. And they made them through buying better products. Starbucks wasn't the only coffee game in town, but it was the one to catch the wave. Not that there weren't challenges. Baristas, the people who pull the coffee shots and mix the drinks, had to be trained not only to make coffee, but to create an atmosphere. Your decaf short latte. You go to, to the Italian coffee bars. Obviously, everything is spoken in Italian. And there's a romance to the language and a romance to the experience. And in the early days of the imprinting of the coffee bar, we wanted to kind of steep ourselves in authenticity. Hi, triple grande mocha. Thank you. Tall cappuccino. We actually would meet from 6 to 10 a.m. in the morning and basically go to coffee school. We learned how to speak the Starbucks language, that is, uh, grande, non-fat, no whip, whatever. Triple grande mocha. And the customers had to learn Starbuckian, too. Once mastered, the language also built a bond with the Starbucks brand. There is this kind of desire for belonging, and Starbucks, I think, here has sort of nurtured this deliberately. The language of Starbucks, the drink names that comedians like to tell jokes about, was, I think, calculated to get people to belong, to feel like insiders. Language works that way, right? Once you master the language, you're part of the inside group. And then there's that size thing. Tall, no whip mocha. The small is a tall, a medium is a grande, and a big is a vente, um, which is not really a word. It means 20 in Italian. I mean, they kind of invented that um, to get the Italianness, but to get the sizeness in there. You know, everything's bigger, grander, better, right? Well, I think, you know, when you walk into a store, you don't want to say, give me a small. You want to say, give me a tall. And so there is a little bit of marketing in there. Once it had won Seattle, Starbucks set out to conquer the country. 
it wouldn't be long before millions of Americans were beaming into Starbucks and speaking Starbuckian speak. Brand Cafe Latte. Howard Schultz likes to describe selling coffee in terms of merchandising mystery and romance. He sometimes sounds like he regards Starbucks the way other people regard religion. We're not in the business of filling bellies. We're in the business of filling souls. Granted, it does seem very odd for someone of his status to be talking like that and so aspirational in his tone. But really, he believes it. Some call it the Starbucks halo effect, branding the company with a do-gooder aura so that its customers feel good about shelling out premium prices for cups of java. I talked to a woman the other day, and she said to me, I love Ethos water. And this is the water Starbucks sells, because I feel like I'm doing good every time I buy a bottle of water. Well, that halo effect adds value to the brand. She paid $1.80 for that bottle of water. A bottle of water at Wawa, where I might go, is a dollar, maybe 99 cents, dollar 29, but I don't get much halo. You might say, okay, they're full of crap, and, and you know, th this is how we feel. We love this company. We love what we do. We're passionate about coffee. We're passionate about the beverages we serve. We don't want to be in the transaction business. We're in the business of human connection and humanity, creating communities in a third place between home and work. I think what makes him a brilliant marketer is his sincerity. Take one of those. I do I think he believes here. that he's delivering more than coffee to people. He believes the message. He's basically the spiritual leader of the company. When he wanders around Starbucks coffee-soaked laid-back commons at the Seattle office, an excited buzz percolates from his workforce. There was always something magical when he would walk around the commons area. When you would see him, heads would kind of turn and go, oh, there he is. Much like a rock star, they would just have this look and went like, there's Howard. And he would walk by, many times stop and talk to folks. And that would always make someone stay, always. He has made quite a leap in status from his early days when he was growing up in a tough and poor part of Brooklyn, New York. Then Howard Schultz wasn't looking to become the coffee king. He was just looking for a way out. He had been born there in 1953 and moved with his family to the Bayview Housing Projects in Canarsie when he was three. A bullet hole mars the glass entrance to the building where his family of five struggled to survive. Everyone in this building, everyone in these projects, pretty much was exactly the same. Everyone was trying to get access to the American dream. Schultz says he learned a lot growing up here with a rainbow of neighbors. They taught me a lot also because it was a very, at the time, it was a very comprehensive, diverse group of people. White, black, Puerto Rican, Italian, and uh, everyone had to get along. He also witnessed his father's failures and the grinding pain of expectations never achieved. My father was a high school dropout. Uh, he was a veteran of the war, and uh, he had a series of one really bad blue-collar job after another. When Schultz was seven, his father broke his leg on the job and was housebound for months. He basically was turned loose. He was out of work. There was no hospitalization, no health insurance, no workman's compensation, and we were done as a family. And I saw the hopelessness. I saw the plight of a working-class family. I saw the fracturing of the American dream firsthand. Howard turned to sports. He was a natural athlete and leader on the basketball courts around home and the football field at school. He imagined he could use those talents to manufacture an opportunity to succeed. My dream was to get out. It was, I never allowed myself to dream beyond that. I was afraid to dream beyond that. And uh, on one level, I always kind of believed in myself that there would be a time when I would succeed. He made his escape from Canarsie with a football scholarship to Northern Michigan University in 1970. But he got injured in his first season, had to quit the team, and lost his scholarship. He sometimes had to sell his blood to pay his way through college. His fierce determination and natural sense of showmanship led him straight into a career in sales. In 2006, Howard was ranked 359th on the 400 richest Americans list in Forbes magazine, but he has never forgotten his Brooklyn roots, which informed not only his life, 
but Starbucks company policy. I had the voice of my father in my ear and my mind for so many years about what he went through and what I saw as a kid. This company that we've, we've built, for me personally, was trying to build a company that he, the kind of company that he never got a chance to work for. In 1988, Schultz was instrumental in having Starbucks offer health insurance to part-time employees who work at least 20 hours a week. Today, Starbucks spends more on health care for employees than on the raw coffee beans for their North American business. Starbucks is one of the first, if not the first, fast food place to offer part-time employees full health care benefits. So that helps employees to feel as though the company cares about me. They do it because they know that a happy partner behind the counter, more likely than not, is going to produce a happy customer in the end. In the Starbucks lexicon, all employees are called partners and have a stake in the company. That's something that gets drilled in early within the culture of the company is the fact that we're all partners in this mission to change the way the world drinks and appreciates coffee. And literally, the health care plan for our employees and bean stock, which is what we call equity in the form of stock options, all of those things were really a tribute to my dad. Howard's father died before Schultz bought Starbucks and never saw his son's overwhelming success. But Schultz remembers what his mother asked when she first visited Starbucks headquarters. Do all these people get paid? And then she said, how? How do they, do you write the check? <laughs> and I said, you know, Mom, I know they get paid, but I don't know how. By the late 1990s, Starbucks had become a fixture on corners in cities all over the country. Some stores were even located directly across from one another to cut down on lines. The demand for pricey cups of coffee seemed endless. If you think about the U.S. and the image of the U.S., and probably the way it is, it's very coffee, nervous energy, um, very work, 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 getting wired. It's, it's a very American drink, so to speak. The number one complaint customers have about Starbucks, number one complaint, not enough location. Believe it or not, I want a Starbucks closer to me. In 1996, Starbucks decided the time was ripe for expansion outside of North America. And their first choice destination was Tokyo. Starbucks was going global. But would the world buy what it had to sell? By 1996, Starbucks, once just a little coffee bean store in Seattle, had expanded to thousands of locations across North America. Now, it would jump continents Schultz hired some consultants to tell the company how to open a shop in Japan. We hired a consultant, big bill, thick folder, presentation to the board, and they came in, guns blasted, ready to present to me and the board. And they said, ladies and gentlemen, you will not succeed in Japan. Your no smoking policy is an anathema, forget it. The store size has to be smaller because the rents are so expensive. People in Japan will never eat or drink anything in the street because a Japanese person would lose face if they're caught eating food publicly. Go somewhere else. As he had for his entire career, Howard followed his gut instincts and ignored their advice. Not because we were arrogant, because we believed that what we had created is going to work. Without any international experience, the company opened its first store in August of 96 in the Ginza in Tokyo. The big question was whether or not the coffee and environment, which added up to the Starbucks experience in Starbuckian speak, would be lost in translation. We're approaching the store. There's a queue of hundreds of Japanese, hundreds on the street. And I turn to the peop Japanese people with me and I said, did you hire extras? We cut the red ribbon. A young Japanese kid runs to the front of the line who slept there through the night to be the first customer. Can't speak a word of English. And he says, double tall latte. Tokyo proved the Starbucks brand could travel, and it did. There were some grousing from critics in cities with long coffee traditions of their own, like Vienna. The coffee house provides something which can never be replaced by any fast fast food outlet or whatever you call it i mean the starbucks is no alternative no substitute for a coffee house it is a place to get coffee on the quick 
However, many of the natives didn't seem to find Starbucks American brew hard to swallow. Soon the company was doubling its revenues every three years. I told Americano to meet them and them. There are now Starbucks in 39 countries, from Kuwait to China. The awareness that Starbucks has in places we've never been continues to amaze us. We open up stores in places that we were never in, no marketing, no promotion. We just open up the stores, we open up the door, sign on the door, and thousands of people come in and they order frappuccino and lattes and a pound of coffee. And you ask yourself, how? Bryant Simon, who is writing a book on Starbucks, has visited 400 of them around the world. And he finds that each one is a little different. In Spain, which is a place I spent a lot of time observing people in Starbucks, Virtually no one gets coffee to go. It's a destination and people go and stay there. It's a real date place in Spain. While the British customers seem not as well trained as their American cousins. They're dirtier in Britain. Not that the British were dirtier, but that they drink more in store and labor's expensive and they can't clean it up as fast. In 1999, Starbucks expanded into China, even opening a store in Beijing's Forbidden City. Critics said you couldn't sell coffee in a land of tea drinkers, but Schultz proved them wrong. They don't drink coffee in China, but they are drinking Starbucks. And we are, we're really succeeding there at levels that are really inspiring and uplifting because we're, we're creating a company that people recognize as unique and special. Wherever one goes, one thing is always the same. A Starbucks is a Starbucks, and all the drinks are identical to one another all over the world. All this globe hopping has not only made Starbucks a multinational corporation, it has also drawn brick brats from critics who claim Starbucks is contributing to the evils of globalization. Demonstrators trashed one of the company's stores in Seattle during a World Trade Organization conference. They're not just a global corporation. They depend in large measures on the inequities of the world between the developed world and the underdeveloped world. Show me a country that grows coffee and I'll show you a place where people are largely poor. Still, Starbucks has always prided itself on paying more to farmers for coffee than other large coffee companies. They have also agreed to buy a certain amount of what is called fair trade coffee and have invested in ways farmers can practice sustainable agriculture. The fact that Starbucks is very environmentally responsible and sort of tries to be corporate responsible simply is a simple evolution that the, the neo-coffee movement in the U.S. basically grew out of the 60s and the idea of the green movement and social responsibility and whole foods and all that kind of thing. So it makes sense that they are like that, and I do think they are like that. Starbucks may have begun as a David, but by the 21st century, it had turned into a Goliath with virtually no major competitors. Some backlash was inevitable. People are never satisfied with what Starbucks has done because they feel that they should and could do more. If the criticism sometimes stung Howard Schultz, he didn't let on. He just kept opening more Starbucks. He planned to open 40,000 of them around the world, a number that would leave even McDonald's in Starbucks dust. In the cupping rooms at Starbucks headquarters in Seattle, Chairman Howard Schultz takes part in a ritual. He smells the coffee and tastes the coffee, and sometimes even swallows the coffee from samples of Starbucks fresh roasted beans from around the world. Starbucks brews about 230 million gallons of coffee a day. Most of its coffees are blends of beans that are shipped in green or raw from 28 countries. In its giant roasters, just this one Starbucks plant goes through about two million pounds of beans in a week. And there are four more plants like this one. That's a lot of Java. And Starbucks tasters make sure that the product is up to their standards before it's shipped. All we're doing is taking plain ground coffee in a glass with hot water. It's as simple a way as you can make a cup of coffee. And then you just engage in the aspiration and expectoration. That's a <laughs> slight name for slurping and spitting. Dave Olson was with Starbucks almost from its beginnings and developed many of the blends popular with customers. The company uses only Arabica beans, 
which are grown at the highest elevations and are much more expensive than the Robusta beans used in most canned coffees. The middle coffee, the Verona, is a blend of Latin American coffees with some Asia Pacific coffees and a little bit of dark roast. We take all of our knowledge about purchasing, roasting, and then blending and put it together in that cup. And I haven't cupped it for a long time, and it is beautiful. Yeah, it's a it remarkable cup. just a beauty. Everything at Starbucks is carefully researched and calibrated. New drinks are tested. Starbucks even measures the internal heat of hot sandwiches they market. It's quality control, but it is also a way to create excitement with new products in their stores and a little bit of theater. And Jenny, you have a grande peppermint non-fat light whip mocha. Starbucks sells some 55,000 different drink combinations. All that experience pouring out cups has led to some serious contributions to coffee culture. Starbucks banished styrofoam cups in preference for paper ones. They came up with a nice sleeve to prevent toasted fingers. And then there's the nifty lid which won't cut your lip, like the old kind often did. Without this lid, I don't think we'd be standing here today. Of course, the main draw for consumers is what's in this special cup. It's the source of a love affair that's let Starbucks charge more than $4 for a cup. And how much of that is profit margin for the company? There was lots of margin within every Starbucks beverage that they make. How much that is, I'm going to probably say it's almost 90%. So there's a lot of margin in there. For some, what makes the price worthwhile are some things about Starbucks that developed by accident. The idea of putting comfortable furniture and couches in stores percolated up from customers. The initial model that Schultz had um, was of an Italian coffee bar where people stood, had their coffee, and left. But what he found was that people wanted places to go. And when he put chairs there, people stayed. And so they began to put more chairs there. And when they put a couch there, people really liked it. And you need a place like Starbucks where it's perfectly acceptable to go and sit all day and talk to people and do your thing with other people. So I think they're serving a great purpose that way and something that until until Starbucks basically had almost disappeared in the U.S., sadly. Another innovation came about when a Seattle store manager who used to run a music shop began playing jazz in his store, and the customers liked it so much, they asked for his selections. And Starbucks saw how music and sound can create an emotional response from customers. And now I can add to a customer's experience that, that they thought, wait a minute, every store should have music. And so that store manager began, basically, the Starbucks music department. And that led to the rise of Starbucks Entertainment. The coffee company is now a big player in the music industry, putting out hot-selling CDs compiled from music at licenses. Those 40 million pairs of eyes and ears a week are a ready-made market. We won eight Grammy Awards, including Album of the Year with Genius Loves Company, the album with Ray Charles, his last album. A coffee company won a Grammy Award, Album of the Year, unheard of. And that inspired us to, to do more, inspired us to think about what else can we do that doesn't take anything away from the coffee experience, but complements it. So they went into the movie business. We screened movies for almost a year, and we saw this movie called Aquila and the Bee. And in the middle of the movie, I turned to everybody, they turned to me, we knew this is the movie. The company is listed as a producer on the movie, but it didn't put up any cash. Instead, it offered its stores as a selling platform. The halo of the Starbucks brand, our network, the power of our endorsement, and the fact that we're going to educate the country on this movie. At the company's 2007 stockholders meeting, Schultz announced that former Beatle Paul McCartney had signed a deal with Starbucks Music Company for an album of original McCartney songs to be sold only in Starbucks stores. Starbucks rakes in more than $8 billion a year on its ever-spreading range of products, but you won't see a commercial for Starbucks on TV. They know that their customers are people who like to believe that they're beyond the seduction of advertising. Their stores are their advertisements. The cup itself is an advertisement. I mean, $2 billion a year of people walking around with cups 
that's an advertisement. And then everyone repeats that they don't advertise. Some people think that with all the in-store hyping of these products, Starbucks may be losing the thing that made it attractive in the first place. I'm not sure that they're creating the same romance with coffee. The aura of coffee, the tradition of the coffee house. Starbucks customers start to feel as though they might be used in this marketing game. And so to me, I believe that Starbucks runs the risk of the Starbucks brand taking over the Starbucks experience. After two decades, Starbucks had attained an enviable place in the world. The green dot and the mermaid had become iconic symbols of a trusted brand on the same level of recognition as much older companies like Coca-Cola. They've taken coffee and they've made it gourmet, but they've also made it accessible. And so for all the folks that want to live and to be part of the finer things in life, Starbucks definitely plays into that, and I think is one of the reasons why the brand has been so endearing to so many folks. There were few major cities in the world you could go to without seeing the familiar green sign. And back home, the company even began opening drive throughs Now, we live in a car culture. A number of the drive through stores I've been in will do very steady drive through business, but the stores themselves seem a little flatter, a little emptier, a little less alive. You lose that specialness. It becomes almost expected. It is where that anticipation gets sucked out. And instead, it's just going like, I'll have a cup of coffee. Howard Schultz, who created the modern Starbucks, recognized the dangers posed by the company's success. Well, I think most things in the world that have gotten big haven't stayed uh, good. The road is paved with so many companies that have achieved this level of success that are not here anymore. In a 2007 Valentine's Day memo to Starbucks executives, Howard Schultz criticized decisions which he said had diluted the Starbucks experience and taken away from the Italian coffee house atmosphere, which he wanted preserved. The memo is going to be taken very seriously within the company. Anything Howard says, the company perks up and says, OK, we got to listen, we got to do this. That's a given. Among other things, the memo wondered if replacing the old manual coffee makers with automated ones had taken the theater and romance out of the brand. Flavor lock packaging means the stores don't even smell much like coffee anymore. The number one challenge in the entire company is how do we get big and stay small? How do we maintain the trust with our customers and the intimacy with our people? And as soon as we get the mentality of a corporation where we're, we're doing things that are insensitive. We're doing things that are not consistent with our heritage. We have ourselves to blame. And we've done a couple of those things. We have to be very, very careful. The challenge was how to preserve Starbucks' homey Main Street gathering place feel while meeting Wall Street's expectations for growth. The trick for them, and this is a very difficult trick, is to find the balance between maybe flagship stores that really feature all the benefits and then more functional stores. You can grow without losing your soul. Howard wants to balance those two. Starbucks' mission to teach America about good coffee has been accomplished. Even one of its early founders agrees about that. I think that Starbucks still makes a very strong effort to have at its core top flight coffee, and which is amazing for a company their size. Really, truly amazing. There's a Starbucks near my office that I, I probably go to three times a week, and I always enjoy it. They have changed the way the world drinks and appreciates coffee. The real question now is what's next? Howard Schultz still has ambitions. We want to kind of grow the company in a way that perhaps ultimately Starbucks could achieve the status of what Coke did in their heyday, and that is the most respected brand, most recognized brand in the world, and that's possible for us. To people who pine for the good old days when Starbucks was young and new, Schultz has only this to say. Let me give you a secret. I hear people who have been at Starbucks 10, 15, 20 years, all the time, talking about the good old days. Bullsh <laughs> they were not that good. We were, we were struggling, fighting. These are the good days. And it is fun, and it's enormously exciting. So, Lauren, I've been trying a sugar-free vanilla one-pump hazelnut non-fat latte. 